You are no god, you shout. Then this will be a fair fight, the whispers answer. You howl your defiance as he comes at you. He is clearly weak and wounded, but you are weak too. You have gathered up but a fraction of the power you had. You must keep him at bay for a moment longer. Hold him back while you recover your full strength. For in this moment, you are just Horus Lupercal. You swing Weldbreaker and deflect the path of his sword. Sparks fly like comets. Your talon rakes through armor, flesh and bone. Blood fogs the air between you. His mind burns through your nervous system, disrupting your motor control and cascading pain through your core. You block his mind, twist it sideways through 13 dimensions and render irreparable ischemic damage. You clamp his throat with your talon, you crush his windpipe and sever his carotid. Blood squirts in a hosing arc, more blood snorts and spurts from his mouth as he chokes. He batters his blade across your skull and shoulder, shredding the serpent's scales. You push him away, refractors banging as they fail and collapse, and punish him with your maul as he staggers back, clutching at his throat. You break his wrist, the war blade clatters from his hand. You crunch his ribs. You unleash blood light from the eye of your chest plate and torch his face. His hair burns, the flesh of his cheek melts to the bone. One eye roasts and bursts, Worldbreaker shatters his spine. You feel the power returning to you. It can't come fast enough. You need all of it. You need all of it. Reeling, he burns you back. A beam of light rakes from his one remaining eye. Pure force, blue-white, the focused will of the human race, piercing your darkness as the beacon of the hollow mountain pierces the void. The pain is more than a man can bear, and you are still just a man. It's not the power, it's what you do with it, and you, fool, let it go. You let it all go. You fall to your knees, on fire within and without. His psychic beam continues to incinerate you. Please, you ask. Please, you implore. Give it back. Give the power back to me. Oh, they will. They will. The old four will let you have it all back, because it serves their interests. But they will make you suffer first, as a cautionary reprimand for spurning their generous gifts. They will make you pay for that, in fire and agony, and they will let the punishment last a while. The Emperor, their only real foe, cannot kill you, after all. For all the power he salvaged and scraped together, for all the tricks he has played to weaken you and render you vulnerable when you were entirely invulnerable, for all the ways he has made you look like a fool, he cannot actually kill you. He does not have the means, not even him, to kill the limitless thing you have become, the instrument of chaos incarnate. Because that's what you are, Horus Lupercal. That's all you are. Warmaster. That is all you'll ever be, first found son. A slave to their darkness, a weapon in their hands, a puppet on their strings, beguiled by their promises and lies, an instrument with no mind of its own, designed to shatter the shield of humanity and tip the human species into the neverness of the warp. On your knees, caught in the torrent of your father's flame, you look up at him. You see it now, at last, perhaps as he always has seen it. A simple truth, a secret that should have been kept, despite everything. Some truths are too dangerous to know, or too lethal to hear. That's why he kept it for 30,000 years. Now you know it too. You see, through insurmountable pain, everything that has been ruined, and everything that has been betrayed. You cannot ask him for forgiveness. You don't dare, and you can't speak it anyway. But he can see it in your eyes. You were too weak to resist them then, and you will be too weak in another moment when they relent and replenish you with their abominable gifts. Your eyes beg him for mercy. A son to his father. End this. 
End it now, if you can. If that is even possible, end it before it is too late. If you can't do it, no one can. The burning stops. The psychic beam abates. You sway, gasping. Your father has a knife, an old stone thing. What is it? It's so small in his hand, so ugly. That won't do it. That won't be enough. He seems to hesitate, reluctant. You clench, in sudden spasm and convulsion, and cry out. The power is returning. It is flowing back into you with great rapidity, as though the old four are suddenly desperate to restore their gifts. What do they know? What have they seen that makes them act in such haste? Your father looks at the knife. I wait for you, and I forgive you. He drives it into your heart. Loken is on his feet. He sees the giant blade glint. A simple stone knife won't break that plate. Something so small surely can't. The blade goes in. Heart thrust. The quick mercy stroke of a custodian's misericordia. Practical and unfussy. The two figures freeze together for a moment. The kneeling son, the standing father, joined by the knife. And through that blade, the emperor channels the full force of his will. The sublime power, a psychic blast of profound magnitude, courses down the ancient blade like lightning conducting through a metal rod. The fireball flash of its strike is brighter than all creation. Then the light begins to die. A darkness falls quickly. It is not the glossy blackness of the court's infinite architecture. It is soft and mute, like the advent of night or the dimming of vision and sense. Horus smiles. His smile is no longer the terrible smile that greeted them when they entered the Lupercal court. The smile that shivered the world with mortal dread. It is now the smile Loken remembers from long ago. There is no blood. The Athame is sharp. Sharp enough to cut space. Sharp enough to slice reality. It has waited a long, long time for this. From the original killing that made it and stained it with the shadow of all murder, to this, the eighth death that it was promised. Horus smiles. The smile vanishes. Then so does flesh, lips and mouth, revealing another smile. A rictus grin of teeth, a mask of bone. There is no redemption, for the time for that is long past. There is only resignation. And in the end, it's just a man killing his son with a stone. The blade slides out and turns to dust. The body falls, and then the galaxy burns. The story is not what we thought it was. Warhammer 40k was always based upon this idea that 10,000 years ago, there was a great crusade, and this all came crashing down when Horus Lupercal, the first found son of the Emperor, turned on his father. He took some of his brothers with him and their legions, but ultimately Horus would be defeated in the Siege of Terror. And when that happens, the Emperor would obliterate Horus's soul. We are all told this story as children in the UK, and it is something that we cling to dearly. And now we find out that that is technically not true because if if we just go back just a small thing dan dan Abner decided to slip in there minor tiny detail the emperor's last words to horus lupercal i wait for you and i forgive you and you will notice that nowhere in that passage did the emperor of mankind destroy horus's soul it's said that horus dies multiple times what that means for 40k is huge so another thing to talk about is Abaddon. Abaddon's importance in the story was so much less than I thought it would be. I thought we would get far more Abaddon than we did. We do get a really interesting kind of implication from his uh, fight with Valdor, which we'll talk about in another stream. But it seems that Horus Lupercal is not out of the picture. And this is something that's actually backed up in more lore that we see in the setting. So once upon a time, Conrad Kurz was insane. And he decided to build an effigy of the Emperor. And when he did that, he had a conversation with it. And the Emperor told Conrad Kurz that none of the traitor Primarchs are beyond redemption. That includes Horus. And so this idea that Horus could someday return to Warhammer 40k 
I think he's absolutely now on the cards. Now, to clarify, in terms of a time scale, we're talking many, many years, okay, in the future, right? But the people that write Warhammer 40k don't want the setting to go on forever. So it's going to come to a head at some point. And I think when that happens, the Emperor is waiting for his son. Now, this book is very clear on the idea that the Emperor of Mankind will one day return, which is sort of surprising and sort of not. Because on the one hand, we all expect that in the end game. However, the circumstances are much clearer now. So another thing that happens in the book, of course, is the Emperor ascends onto the Golden Throne. Now, this chapter is distressingly short. We see it through Malkador's perspective. One thing that he makes quite clear in the book is that the Golden Throne does keep the Emperor alive. However, the Emperor also keeps the Golden Throne alive. It's a reciprocal relationship. Because of that, Malkador now believes that Constantine Valdor and Rogue Dawn have made a mistake. And he actually says something to this effect. No one else in the Imperium knows this. He says, I want to correct them. I want to explain their mistake, but I can't. And even if I could, perhaps I wouldn't. The truth is brutal. At least this way, they have some solace, some small consolation in the face of tragedy. So, like, yes, he's talking a bit about the fact that his friend is about to be tortured for 10,000 years, but also the knowledge that they can actually take the Emperor off the Golden Throne at some point in the future, presuming they've got someone to sit on the Golden Throne, is important knowledge for the Imperium. And the Imperium now doesn't have that information, it seems. A lot of people were saying it's like Cain and Abel. So it absolutely is supposed to be like Cain and Abel. So that dagger that you see is the Athame dagger. Now, I'll be honest, I did not know I liked Elenius Pius so much until he dies because it's a really sad scene. It's a very well-written scene. I loved that so much. Very great writing from Dan Abnett. Elenius Pius is the one who gives the Athame dagger to the Emperor of Mankind. The dagger was actually broken in a previous book. It was healed almost accidentally kind of by the emperor when the emperor heals Elenius Pius using his godly powers it's a long story and Elenius Pius sees the dagger has now been healed and he realizes that the dagger in the hands of a perpetual is one of the only things that can properly harm Horus Lupica at this stage however it looks very much in the end just like a father stabbing his son there is so much symbolism in this book that Dan Abner actually kind of goes through T.S. Eliot, I think it is, of course, lots of ancient works and all this kind of thing. And he's brought all of that together into this one epic story. So if you're a, a big fan of literature, you will love this novel, I, I'm telling you. It was a pretty cool final battle. It is a cool final battle. So as you can see, the Emperor is absolutely devastated in this fight. Horus absolutely delivers so many blows to him, as expected. Is that the end of the book or do we see more? with Dawn arriving and placing the Emperor on the throne. So yeah, we do. So Dawn and Valdor then arrive in the throne room. Garvio Loken decides to stay on the Vengeful Spirit. Then like Abaddon and stuff come in. There are bits of talking about like the cleanup that the Ultramarines do in the system. Obviously, they have uh, no mercy at all for the traitors. There's even like a conversation that Garvio Loken has with Abaddon about possibly surrendering the Sons of Horus and maybe... Like Gavio Loken thinks like Dawn or Gilliman might be willing to accept the Sons of Horus back in under some like extreme conditions because he can kind of vouch for them. My question now, why didn't the clones work? I don't think the clones should work at all. You know, Fabius Bio is not a master of the warp. So he wouldn't know how I think how to pull the souls back in. What's happened to Horus' soul? Maybe they will change it and, and like if Horus' soul has been destroyed, I didn't get that from that scene at all. I really didn't. What happened to Garvio? Died. Died to Erebus. Um, Garvio is, is very important. So um, the Emperor actually tricks Horus Lupercal by pretending to be Garvio Loken, which is kind of a clever play. And I guess it mirrors the fact that Horus tricked the Emperor into coming onto the Vengeful Spirit. So I think that's what he's going for there. I think one of the things that's worth noting is that the Athame Dagger, it can split reality. So perhaps that's where Horus's soul is. Maybe it's in like an alternate reality that the Emperor can access in the future, something like that. Bits of Horus's soul definitely have survived in the canon. We know that. Uh, Abaddon has seen them. I heard the Emperor fights Horus in a Yu-Gi-Oh battle. Uh, well, I, I tell you what is weird, actually. It's funny you say that because there are these scenes where we see them fight throughout like multiple dimensions and stuff. 
So, like, weirdly, one of them could have been a, a Yu-Gi-Oh! baton that just wasn't covered. So, if you want to believe that, you, you definitely probably can. So, we could see a redeemed Conrad Kurz, possibly. In the end game, all cards in play. Can you clarify on the Samus thing? Yeah, is it time, Messery, that Erebus created Samus? Or does he birth him into real space? Yeah, it's it's time messing. So, I mean, Erebus actually does talk about this specifically. Is he says he had to, to close the circle and complete the cycle. We have lost a day. Horus has failed. But this isn't the end. There will be other opportunities to do it and do it better. We will learn from our mistakes. We will be stronger. We will be far greater than this. If it takes a thousand years or ten thousand, a bit on the nose there, Dan, uh, we will triumph. And to do that, we need guidance. Do you know how demons are born? It's a thing you should learn. A demon may die long before it is born. Time is meaningless to them. A circle, you see? They come back because they never go away. And some of them are great powers of special significance. One of those played a vital role in this. It must exist to do that, just as it must exist to help us in our future efforts. So it had to be born. And this happened to be the moment. I think it, what's interesting about all this is like, in all these questions, it sounds like, you know, will Horus come back? Will Conrad Kurtz come back? I think the answer is yes. But we've already, the Games Workshop has already started on the uh, Star Child storyline in Warhammer 40k. That's going to dominate the setting for many years to come. So I don't think we're going to move on from that for a while. Like Games Workshop has to create this whole new character in the near future, a boy or a girl on a planet somewhere that's going to have the soul of the emperor. That's going to take, you know, probably a decade to sort through all of the, the story that's going to go along with that. You put that with all the Primarchs returning, etc., etc. We've got a lot of ground to go. But uh, yeah, the door is is open. I recall hearing that Horus's soul was fighting in the war from now to eternity or parts of his soul. Yeah, that's right. So yeah, it's like part of his soul. So uh, it, when Horus um, goes to the gate of Molech, he kind of makes a similar deal with the that the Emperor does. And when he makes that deal, he, he sacrifices part of his soul. So those permanently belong to the Chaos Gods. Does he specifically say 10,000 years? Yes, but to be fair, <laughs> that happens so many times. Oh man, I wish I might go through the book and see if I can find all the times they do this. But like, there are so many times where they go, I don't care if this takes us 10,000 years, we will beat you. And it's like, for God's sake, guys, come on. We know we know what you're doing. Like, who would go to 10,000 as well? You'd say a million. If you were trying to exaggerate, you'd go, I don't care if it takes a million years. Who says 10,000? Oh, yeah. You know what else is hilarious? Ingo Peck, at the end of this story, <laughs> is still trapped under the Imperial Palace. <laughs> I just realized that. <laughs> that is so funny. I can't wait to see what they do with that storyline. I love the idea that Ingo Peck has just been stuck for 10,000 years. Absolute nightmare. I mean, in theory, John Grammaticus could go and save him. But we do see what happens to John Grammaticus. He's pretty busy for now. So uh, <laughs> Ingo Peck, who is, if you're not familiar, is the first captain of the Alpha Legion. He is stuck under the Imperial Palace at the end of the Horus Heresy, and he can't move. There are also lots of other Alpha Legionnaires under the Imperial Palace. That would be a hell of a campaign to do. So it's true that they spoiled Loken. I wish it was not like that. I would have much rather he be killed by Horus. I'm just going to be honest with you. Maybe my mind will change on that in the future. The afterword of the book talks a lot about the symbolism within it. And when you do read that kind of thing, you do kind of gain a lot of appreciation for the story that you maybe didn't have earlier. It does create a cycle with the start of the series, etc, etc. The thing I didn't get, right, is that Samus is supposed to be the demon of the Ruin Storm. That's what he's described as. That's not what Garvey or Loken is. He's not the Ruin Storm or whatever. If he was created from the death of Torgaddon, that would have made sense. But yeah, it didn't really make sense to me. So the part where the Emperor talks to Dawn got cancelled. Correct. That's not in this book. There's no law on them having kind of a secret conversation and changing up the Golden Throne. As Dawn goes in, he just kind of finds them dead. Later to the party, how did Horus lose the god powers and then regain them? The reason Horus loses his god powers is because he gives them up. Horus absolutely kind of beats the Emperor. He's far more powerful than the Emperor in the start of this novel. The Emperor doesn't really stand the chance. Horus actually gets him to the point that he's basically got him about to die. And there's even a passage where he talks about how like, it's not very satis, um, satisfying. 
He's beaten him to such an extent. The Emperor's just an old man now. And then he sees Garvey or Loken, and Loken talks to him and says, like, why are you remaining a puppet then of the Chaos Gods? You're always going to be a puppet of the Chaos Gods if you stay like this. You don't need this power. You've already won. You can hear the whispers. You can hear them trying to control you to give up that power. And Horus, believing that he's already won, believes this. He gives up his power. And then he notices that it's not actually Garvey or Loken, but an apparition of the Emperor. And the Emperor tricks Horus into giving up his powers. And on the one hand, it's a bit of a shame to lose your powers that way. On the other hand, there is kind of a completed circle. The Emperor also gives up his powers in the previous book. And at the same time, Horus tricks the Emperor into coming onto the Vengeful Spirit. So the idea that the Emperor also tricks Horus later on actually makes quite a lot of sense. I can tell you what Loken says to him. It's not too late, not for you, not for us. You've done what you set out to do. Let go of the power to prove you are Horus, to prove you are a man and not a puppet. Horus says, I told you, and Loken says, you did, but their claws are deep in you, and their lies delude you. Prove them wrong. You say you took their power into yourself to achieve this end. Well, it is achieved, Father. So if you meant what you said, you don't need the power anymore. Set it aside while you still can. Show the world of men that you are still one of them, and true to your word. Show the foul gods you are not their plaything, or a helpless instrument of their designs. You have just slain a golden king in a cathedral of darkness. Did those aspects, light and dark, choose themselves? Symbols have power. Cast them off. Get rid of them. This darkness, this black heart, this palace of terror. Cast the power away. Now you are done with it. Use the one thing you had that your father did not. A feeling heart. All right, guys, I think I'm going to call it there because it's been a long, long day. Let me know what you guys think of all that in the comments. I hope you enjoyed it wild place to end the heresy thank you so much for watching i hope you enjoyed it a lot of people on this stream really appreciate it thank you so much everybody if you did get a membership do feel free to jump in discord do check out the extra content on the channel but thank you so much and i'll see you next time